I'm Lars, I'm Director of Education for IOHK. So um, I do Haskell courses, just did one for two months on Barbados. But I also feel it's important not to just do education, but also do some, get your hands dirty. So I'm also leading the incentives work stream in Cardano. And uh, I'm in Hamburg today at the Blockchain Mania meetup and want to explain our ideas for the incentives at Cardano. And I hear that the um, audience is very technical, so that's quite exciting. So I, I hope that I can go into quite some depth and explain how it really works, why it's important, what we hope the outcome will be and, and how we hope to achieve that. In general, the, the point of incentives is to incentivize the participants in a blockchain system to, to do the right thing. And um, in our concrete case of Cardano, that means we, we want a certain distribution of stake. So we want that um, basically there are stake pools, not too many, not too few, and that most of the stake is somehow uh, concentrated in, in one of these stake pools. And uh, the idea is that those stake pools um, actively participate in the protocol and are online when they are supposed to be online and uh, do the things that the protocol demands of them. And the point of incentives is now what we have been busy with over the last months to set up incentives in such a way that if everybody follows his own rational financial interest, then the outcome will be this, this nice distribution of stake that, that we would like to have. Okay, thank you very much for having me here tonight. And uh, I want to talk about incentives in Cardano explain in general what incentives are good for and how we plan to do them in Cardano. So first a couple of words about myself. So I'm actually a mathematician. I have a PhD in pure mathematics from Regensburg University here in Germany. And I did one year as a postdoc at Cambridge University in the UK then worked 10 years in normal software development doing stuff like .NET, C Sharp, even JavaScript, I'm ashamed to say. <laughs> <coughs> and, um, <laughs> but uh, I've, during my time in Cambridge, I first uh, got into contact with Haskell. So I've been an enthusiastic Haskell hobbyist for more than 15 years. And then when the frustration got too big in this uh, normal software development, then I joined IHK in November 2016, first part-time, so full-time I'm now almost exactly a year. And um, I'm the director of education, so that means, for example, that I <coughs> spend a lot of time doing Haskell courses. I just spent January and February in, on Barbados doing a Haskell course there. And uh, last year, two months in Athens. And um, We'll also do things like internal and external trainings uh, on other topics as well, not just Haskell. But um, I feel that somehow it's not good to just do education. You must also really get your hands dirty. So in addition to that, I am also leading the incentives work stream in Cardano. And that's why I'm here tonight and what I want to talk about tonight. So um, I'm leading it, so that means I don't actually do the work. So the, <laughs> <laughs> the team that uh, mostly works on incentives is our chief scientist at IHK, who is also professor at Edinburgh University, Professor Kiarias Agalos. He is also the main inventor of the Ouroboros protocol that Philip introduced. Then Elias, he's a professor at Oxford University, a game, game theorist, and also senior research fellow at IOHK. And then um, Katharina, also at Edinburgh University, who is an Agalos student. So as an introduction to incentives. So what are incentives? Well, in the most general sense, as, at least in the context of cryptocurrencies, it's just a way to encourage people to do what they should do, to follow the protocol and participate in it and follow it faithfully. 
And for example, for Bitcoin, that means um, mining blocks and including transactions into the blocks to, to make Bitcoin work. And in Cardano, as Philip explained, it means being online because uh, remember there's this election process. We have these slots and each slot gets elected a leader. And when it's your time, when this slot comes up, then you are supposed to be online and actually create a block. And you are also, uh, Philip explained, this thing with people sitting around a table throwing dice and then they have to reveal their number at a certain time. So for this process, people are also supposed to be online and, and participate in this protocol. So somehow we want to incentivize people to do these things. And um, <clears throat> even though, as Philip also explained, participating in Cardano is far less expensive than participating in Bitcoin. You don't need server farms. You just need a normal laptop. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I mean, you have some investment and you have to spend time and so on. So it's just fair that you also get reimbursed somehow for your trouble. And um, when I talk about incentives, then in this talk, I mostly will talk about monetary incentives. So you get some ADA for your trouble. And um, so, so, I mean, monetary in this context, of course, me, uh, doesn't mean euro or dollars. It means you get ADA, our cryptocurrency. But that being said, one should uh, not forget that there are other types of incentives as well, uh, like being idealistic or moral and just the general desire to do the right thing. And that should not be underestimated. As an example, in Bitcoin, there's this story from Coindesk from 2014. There was a big mining pool um, that accumulated 42% of total mining power. And as we know, um, the closer it gets to 50%, that's the more dangerous it becomes. And then what happened was that people, uh, members of this mining pool, voluntarily left. And in a matter of two days, um, it dropped from 42% to 38%. And um, they didn't do that because it was financially good for them, on the contrary, rather. They just did it because they believed in Bitcoin and believed in decentralization and just wanted to do the right thing. And um, ideally, of course, these two things would align. So it should, what is in your own best um, selfish interest, financially speaking, should also perfectly align ideally with uh, moral, with doing the right thing. And um, as we have seen this example with the mining pool, in Bitcoin, that's not the case. I mean, people had to choose between making more money and doing the right thing. And um, our goal in Cardano is to align these two things so that when you maximize your profit, you automatically do exactly the right thing. And um, just right. And uh, I say we strive for that, so I'm not claiming that we achieve that, but at least we want to somehow get there and get closer than Bitcoin does. Right, so what exactly is it that we want to incentivize in Cardano? Um, so we want to incentivize stakeholders to be online when they have to participate in the protocol. For example, when they have been elected slot leader for a certain slot, then they should be online at that slot to create the block. And um, on the other hand, I mean, there may be people that are just not interested in doing that or uh, don't have the technical know-how to, to set up the software in the way that makes it possible or maybe don't have the time or whatever. And it will also be possible for those people to delegate the stake um, to a stake pool. Same as in, or similar to mining pools in Bitcoin, there will be so-called stake pools in Cardano. And I'll explain more about delegation later. Um, right, and this is describing what exactly we want. So we have these um, people that own ADA and they can somehow um, join in pools. And uh, actually what we would like ideally would be that about 80% of all the stake, all the ADA should be delegated to a number of K stake pools where K should be probably something around 100. So we would like that 80% of all ADA is organized into, stake, into about 100 stake pools. And those stake pools then should be power users that are online when needed and they should also 
provide additional network infrastructure, so-called relay nodes that we need to, to make the network traffic more efficient. And the, it's okay if the remaining 20% that probably will belong to small stakeholders, they can, if they so wish, also participate in the protocol on their own, or they also can just ignore it and don't do anything. So that should be fine. But this is the configuration we aim for. And somehow we want to set up our incentives in a way that achieve that. So if everybody does what is in his own best financial interest, personal interest, then the outcome should be this. Right, so I mentioned delegation. So let's talk about this. And that's another team. We see Agolos again. As I said, he is chief scientist in, at IHK, so he does a lot of things. Um, so he's involved in coming up with the delegation scheme. <clears throat> then one of his students, Dimitris, who is also at Edinburgh University and a researcher at IOHK. And then Mario, who is originally from Brazil, I believe, and who is at, uh, a lecturer or professor at Tokyo Institute of Technology and also research fellow at IOHK. And um, so stake in because as Philip explained Cardano is a proof of stake system so holding stake means more than it means uh, for Bitcoin to hold Bitcoin. So um, I mean on the one hand Cardano is a normal cryptocurrency so of course uh, by owning ADA you can just use it as any other cryptocurrency you can use it to I mean, you can spend it to buy something to buy stuff. But in addition to that I mean, you don't only have this buying power, the payment power, but in addition to that, holding ADA, as Philip explains, also means that it comes with the right and obligation to participate in the protocol and to create blocks. And these two uses of ADA can be separated by the delegation mechanism. So somebody that owns ADA can keep the spending power, so it's still his money, but he can delegate the power to, to participate in the protocol to somebody else. The idea is exactly for people that maybe are technically not very versed or whatever, don't have time, don't want to worry about it, just want to use it to, as money and are not interested in the protocol, that they then can give their rights away to a power user, to a pool that um, can do the technical things. And uh, as I said before, but let me just stress that, so Delegation does not mean that you lose control over the money. You can still spend it at any time. It just means that the right to participate in the protocol is delegated, not the right to spend the money. Um, this is now a bit technical, but it's only a couple of slides. So this is uh, how the delegation mechanism actually works. So there will be three different types of addresses, basically accounts types of accounts um, and each is associated with a key or key pair in the cryptographic sense. Um, one for payments, one for staking. And as far as payments is concerned, all these three types of accounts are exactly identical. Uh, the difference is in the staking. So there's this base address where both key, the staking key is directly linked to it. Then there's a so-called pointer address where um, it's more indirect, so the address points to a point in the blockchain, and at that point in the blockchain there's some metadata that uh, defines the staking key. And then finally enterprise addresses where that can't stake. And this letter type is meant for exchanges, because there we have the situation that an exchange from the point of view of the blockchain is uh, extremely rich, because all the money that people store at the exchange from the point of the blockchain belongs to the exchange. But, we, but legally, the money, of course, doesn't belong to the exchange, but to, to the people that deposited it there. So for exchanges, we don't want them to use basically their clients' money to um, participate in the protocol. So the idea is that they have special enterprise addresses where they can just transfer funds, but can't uh, do staking, can't create blocks, and so on. Um, I mentioned here for the pointer addresses, I mentioned a pointer to a delegation certificate. So what's that? That's a piece of, I mean, a signed, cryptographically signed piece of metadata in the blockchain. Uh, not necessarily in the blockchain, I come to that. 
um, that transfers staking rights from one staking key to another. And we can probably see where this is going. This is then used to delegate if you want to delegate to a mining pool. And um, it can be published in the blockchain. In that case, it's called a heavyweight certificate. And pointer addresses that I mentioned on the previous slide can um, reference it. And, um, and the way that technically happens is there will be a transaction which ends up on the blockchain. And this transaction can have met metadata. And part of this metadata will be this uh, delegation certificate. And that in particular, uh, sorry come to that so right I just wanted to say this first um, so you also automatically then have to pay for for these delegation certificates the heavyweight ones because in order to get this transaction uh, transaction into the blockchain you have to pay the normal transaction fees so it comes with a small cost to to do these delegation certificates uh, right and then this middle sentence is about um, conflicting. I mean, you could, of course, delegate your money to somebody and then to somebody else. So you could have two delegation certificates. And there must be some rule to uh, break the tie. And the rule is simply the later one wins. So whatever is later in the blockchain overrules everything that's before it. Then there are also lightweight certificates. So they are not published on the blockchain and not part of the metadata of, um, of a transaction. They only become public as part of a block. So those are included in the headers of blocks um, by the creator of the block to prove that he actually has the staking rights for the address that was elected slot leader. And um, then there's another ingredient. So for these staking pools, they will have to formally register. So it's it's uh, written in the ledger on the blockchain uh, registration certificate, uh, also embedded in a special transaction. So basically, you have to pay a fee to create a pool, one of these staking pools. And uh, in this trans, so you pay the system basically this fee, and uh, you embed your certificate. And the certificate uh, contains the staking key of the pool leader. So people that want to join this pool will then create a delegation certificate where they transfer their staking rights to that staking, right, uh, staking key of the pool leader. And, um, right. and they do that in the form of a heavyweight certificate. And this is all quite complicated, but for good reason. So if you think about it, there are these pointers, and there can also be chains. So I can point to, to some staking key, and then there can be another um, delegation certificate that transfers that staking key to yet another one and so on. So there can be several hops. So it can be quite complicated, but that means that um, lots of scenarios are, are somehow modeled with this. So you can have regular user wallets, offline user wallets with cold staking, uh, enhanced privacy, staking pool wallets, exchange wallets. And, and uh, that's why it's so relatively complicated to, to cover all these use cases. So um, I don't want to go into more detail, but it's quite interesting how, how, depending on what you want, how much uh, security you want, how much privacy you want, um, you can set, uh, use these different types of addresses to, to get quite interesting scenarios. Right, so this is how delegation works. And um, now I want to explain the incentive mechanism itself. So first of all, I want to say where the money actually comes from. I mean, we want to incentivize people, but the money to do that or the ADA to do that must come from somewhere. And there are two sources, same or very similar to Bitcoin, actually. First is transaction fees. So um, let me briefly talk about transaction fees. Um, I mean, the second reason is the topic of this talk to, to fund incentives for the stakeholders and the stake pools and so on. There's another reason, the pre prevention of distribu uh, distributed denial of service attacks. So that is an attack where an attacker tries to create hundreds or thousands or millions of transactions and flood the blockchain with it and overload the system. And the idea is if, if you can't do that for free, if you have to pay even a small amount of money for each transaction, then it becomes prohibitively expensive to, um, to create all these flooding transactions. 
So that's the other reason why you need transaction fees. And um, <coughs> how it works is when, similar to other cryptocurrencies, uh, there is a rule what, or actually in Cardano we have specific rules, so it's not just convention, so it's hard coded for each transaction what the minimal fees are, and then in each transaction you have to include at least the minimal fees, so the inputs to your transaction have to uh, are larger than the outputs of the transaction, and the difference must be at least as large as the minimal fees. It can be larger if you feel generous. And um, it's a very simple formula that we use at the moment to calculate these minimal fees. So it's just a, a linear function. So some constant term A plus B times the size of the transaction, where the size is not the size in ADA, but the size in bytes. And uh, yeah, they are the values of these um, constants right now. So you always pay at least this 0.15 ADA. That's the constant term. And then for each byte, you pay this 0.0004 43946 ADA. And uh, as an example, if you have a typical transaction of size 200 bytes, then you would add this constant term A plus the B times 200, and you get something like 0 0.16 ADA. And um, the justification for that form is, so we have the A, for this uh, distributed denial of service attack prevention. So the idea is no matter how small and trivial your transaction is, you always have to at least pay this A. So you, no matter how small it is, um, there's always this cost A, and that A should be high enough so that it makes it too expensive for you to, to create thousands of transactions or millions. And um, the B is uh, basically for fairness. So the idea is, uh, I mean, you should pay for the strain you put on the system. And the, if you have a large transaction, then people that run the Cardano protocol, they have to save, store your data on their computers. So they have to basically buy memory. So somehow it makes sense that the bigger the transaction is, the, uh, the more expensive it should be. Um, we might later add other terms to that. For example, one idea was the, the number of um, UTXOs you have. So, so if your wallet gets more and more complicated, that, um, that also makes it more expensive for people actually uh, to, to store your data. So there could be a term for that. Another idea that we had was to also add a term for the actual size in ADA. So that if you transfer large amounts of ADA, not necessarily large in bytes, but in ADAs, that it should maybe also depend on that, like, uh, yeah. But right now, um, this is the formula we use. So that's the one source of income or, um, for incentives. And um, right, so, so this A and B is, as I said, hard-coded, but we anticipate that probably at some point it might have to be adjusted. I mean, we, yeah, depending on the course of ADA and also on the use statistics of the, of the system. Right, and the second source of um, incentives, as in Bitcoin, will be monetary expansion. So what does that mean? The total supply of ADA today is circa 31 billion ADA. It's a bit more, but less than 32. And um, the maximal supply is 45 billion ADA. So there's still this gap of almost 14 billion ADA available. And uh, the idea is to use those for incentives as well. And obviously, even though it's a large amount, it's a, it's a finite amount. So the idea is to do something similar to what Bitcoin does, to, to have an exponential in, uh, decrease over time. So it slowly gets less and less, uh, the percentage that's used of that for incentives. So, um, <clears throat> and the reason for that is that the hope, of course, is that Cardano will be hugely successful and more and more people will use it. And so the transaction fees will go up and then there's less and less need for, for this uh, extra monetary expansion money. And just as an example, um, how that, what it could look like, but this is purely arbitrary. So this 5% is just really an example. No idea how high that will be. But for example, if we start with this 14 billion and 
each year spend 5% of the still available money on incentives, then the first year we would have 5% of 14 billion, which is 700 million. And then, of course, the available money goes down, and so slowly over the years it becomes less and less, but it's quite a graceful decay. So, But of course, maybe 5% is too high, maybe it will be uh, useless. So it's just an example what that would look like. Right, so these are the two sources where the incentives come from. Now, how are they actually distributed amongst people? And um, as Philip mentioned, in Cardano we have this strict division of time into so-called epochs and slots. So a slot lasts 20 seconds and for each slot um, one coin is randomly chosen and the owner has the right to create this block in that slot. And then an epoch contains 21,600 slots and if you multiply that you see that's exactly five days. And uh, epoch, this is when this uh, election and randomization process happens. So every five days, the people roll their dice and uh, generate a new random number seed. And the um, slot leaders for the next epoch, for the next 21,600 slots are um, elected at that point. So each epoch. Um, right. And the plan is to, to distribute incentives, not as in Bitcoin on a block by block base, but on an epoch by epoch base. So all, in, um, all transaction fees of all the blocks of one epoch plus the monetary expansion uh, will be put into one reward pool for the whole epoch. And then this whole pool will be distributed amongst the people that were active or important in this epoch, which I explain on the next slides. And um, so the basic, the basic idea is it's, uh, okay, and I, I explained it in two steps. First I'll explain how this rewards pool is distributed amongst pools. And then afterwards I will explain how one pool then further splits it between the members of the pool. So now we are just talking about how the whole reward pool is split amongst pools. And uh, the basic idea is to do it proportional to stake. So um, the, your split of the reward pool is proportional to your stake. And um, there are two ways to actually realize that. You just look at the stake and, and do the calculation. Or you could also look at the number of slots in that epoch that um, the pool was elected slot leader. Uh, not the number of blocks it actually created, but the number it was elected uh, pool leader. And this, of course, looks different at first, but if you remember, I mean, as Philip explained, the, prob uh, the probability of being elected slot leader is proportional to your stake. So if you do some basic uh, probability theory 101, you see that these two methods would lead to the same expected outcome. So that's the basic idea. So the more stake you have in the system, you bigger your part uh, in the rewards pool is. And then um, there are two refinements to that. First refinement, uh, I mentioned that um, we, we have this number K of desired number of pools, which should be around 100. So we want around 100 pools. And if you think about it, uh, normally, it would make if, if we just had this proportional rule, then it would make sense for pools to become bigger and bigger because um, they would still get the same reward, but they would have lower costs because the overhead somehow, uh, I mean, if a bigger pool has not much more overhead than a small pool. So th there would be a tendency to big, uh, build big blocks. And in order to prevent that, um, we will just cap the the maximum part of the rewards pool you can get at 1 over k. So in the example of k100, we want 100 pools. That means no matter how high your stake is, you can never get more than 1% of the rewards pool for the epoch. So in this in example, if you have two stake pools A and B, one has 0.3% of stake and one has 1.2% of stake, then A will get 0.3% of the rewards pool according to his stake. But B will not get 1.2%, but only 1%. Nobody will get more than one. And the hope is, of course, that um, this will have the effect that pools won't grow too large, because then their 
uh, some of the, um, the part they get from the reward pool decreases. And it doesn't, uh, doesn't decrease, but it doesn't increase any longer. Right, and the second refinement is, I mean, so far, this was all only depend on the stake the stake pools have, but not on the work they actually do. So there, somehow there must be a mechanism that checks um, whether they actually create the blocks when they were elected. And so there will be some sort of predicate that checks that. So um, it looks at for which slots in a given epoch the pool was elected leader and checks which of these slots the pool actually did its work and did actually create blocks. And depending on these two inputs, it will decide whether you are uh, entitled to get your rewards or not. And um, just as a remark, this predicate, I mean, you can think something like, okay, I must, do, uh, I must um, create at least 90% of the blocks I was elected to create in order to get my reward. It can't be quite that simple, because if you think about it, say you have been elected for um, 100 slots, in an epoch, and you already created 90 blocks. Then you could just switch off your computer and ignore the last 10, because you already reached this uh, threshold of 90%. And if everybody did that, then that would mean that at the end of an epoch, everybody would switch off their computers, which wouldn't be good for obvious reasons. So it must be a bit more complicated than that. Some randomization maybe, or, or maybe just looking exactly at, at the number of uh, created blocks divided by the number of um, elected blocks and, and use that number directly or something like that. But this is the general idea. So you only get your rewards if you actually did the work. Okay, and um, yes, this is the example I just explained why it can't be that simple. Um, right, and if you think about it, so there are two reasons why you get, could get less than your stake. One, if you have, in this example of k equals 100, if you have more than 1% of stake, you won't get this, uh, the amount that's over 1%. Or if you don't do your work, you also don't get the rewards. So that means not, not the whole reward pool is actually distributed. And it's, um, it's important that the rest does not get distributed amongst people. So that's just not distributed at all. But that's actually not a bug, but a feature. Because uh, as Philip also mentioned, we have this treasury thing, and the treasury, of course, also needs funds. So we will just put these unused rewards into the treasury. So it's not lost to humanity, it's just lost to these uh, pools. Right. And an important consequence of this is that um, there is no competition between pools. So um, nothing one pool does can somehow have an impact on how much reward another pool gets. So it's not as if everything I gain, somebody else, is lo else loses. There's this strict um, fencing in of, right, so, so it means that um, there's no incentive for any pool to sabotage another pool. It's not as if, if I sabotage you and you can't create your blocks, I get your rewards. As I explained on the previous slide, the rewards then just go to treasury. I don't get them. So that means the pools are completely independent in this epoch. And no matter what they do, they can only influence their own rewards, but not somebody else's rewards. And um, that means that classical attacks on Bitcoin, like selfish mining, for example, or block withholding, just cannot work because these, the pools are fenced off in this sense from each other. This, it's not that my gain is your loss. It's completely independent. So this is a very important um, property of the scheme. Right. Finally, I want to say now we have determined each pool gets so and so much of the rewards pool. Uh, what then happens to the pool members, which means the people that have delegated their staking rights to this pool. And that uh, will depend on or will follow two guidelines. Um, first, that the pool leader itself, the one that runs the pool, the one that um, registered the pool, filled in this registration certificate, and published it on the blockchain and paid the fees. And she also has the, I mean, she has the hardware and she must be online and so on. So she should get more than the others. And the second um, rule is that the pool members that are not the leaders should be rewarded proportional to the stake they delegate, simply proportional. And uh, 
last slide is an, just an example to, to what that would lo could look like. So, the, but I must stress the fact this is completely arbitrary. So, it's not reflecting actual incentives. It's just an example to, to explain the rules. So, we have three people: Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Alice has 0.2 percent of stake, and she runs a pool with Bob and Charlie. As members, Bob has 0.1 and Charlie has 0.2. And let's say that um, in this epoch, in the rewards pool, there are 5 million ADA. And um, that Alice's pool dutifully did all the created blocks, so she doesn't, I mean, she fulfills this predicate and she gets the full share of her reward. And if you see the whole pool has 0.2% plus 0.1 plus 0.2 is 0.5, which is less than 1%. So she also doesn't get, get kept off. So she gets full, uh, the whole pool gets full 0.5% of the stake, which if you do the calculation is 25,000 ADA. So that's what the pool gets. And now with these two guidelines, um, the Bob has 0.1% of stake and Charlie has 0.2. So Bob will get half of what Charlie gets. But Charlie and Alice have the same stake, but Alice has the overhead of running the pool. So Alice will get more than Charlie, and Bob will get half of what Charlie gets. And um, let's just assume that this additional compensation for running the pool, in this case, will be 5,000 ADA. So Alice up front takes 5,000 of the 25,000, and 20,000 are left. And now those 20,000 are exactly um, distributed according to the stake. So Alice to Bob to Charlie is like one to one to, uh, it's like two to one to two. And if you do the calculation, that gives uh, 8,000, 4,000, 8,000. So Alice gets these 8,000 plus her special 5,000, 13,000, and Bob and Charlie get 4,000 and 8,000. So that's the idea. So, so important to, to just sum up. Um, important thing that for a whole epoch, the incentives are pooled. It's not like in Bitcoin where it's on a block by block base, it gets pooled. Then it gets distributed according to the stake of the pools, um, but kept at a certain number to prevent big pools. And also you can lose your rights to a part of the reward if you don't do your job. And um, Money can not be distributed. It then goes to the treasury, which means there's no competition amongst pools. And then finally, once you have determined how much one pool gets, uh, it gets distributed amongst pool leaders according to their stake, with the exception that the pool leader herself gets, uh, pool members, everybody according to stake, but the pool leader herself gets a bit more. And um, the details are still being worked out, but this is the general idea. So that was right. And as I said before, this is purely fictional. So please now don't start making calculations how much you can earn buying ADA. <laughs> right. And yes, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. I just wanted to encourage you to subscribe to the IOHK YouTube channel, where, for example, the talks from tonight will also be put online soon, I hope. And to also follow us on Twitter. That's input, output, HK. Thank you very much.